Hi, so today we're going to talk about cycles of matter. So there is recycling of matter in the biosphere. So energy, well, matter is neither created nor destroyed, so it has to be recycled. So energy and matter move through the biosphere very differently. Unlike the one-way flow of energy from sun to producer to consumer, matter is actually recycled within and between ecosystems. So even when organisms die, all of the matter that makes them up is recycled back into the atmosphere. And you're going to see this. So elements, chemical compounds, and other forms of matter are passed from one organism to another and from one part of the biosphere to another through biogeochemical cycles. So we get matter from eating other organisms, but you'll also see that matter that we consume is recycled after we die. So it's recycled through the ecosystem. Matter can cycle because biological systems do not use up matter, they actually just transform it. So just as we consume food and we break it down into the compounds that we need for our body, so we're changing it from you know those polysaccharides down to monosaccharides so we can use that glucose for energy, we're just transforming that. We're not changing it, we're not removing it, we're not adding to it, we're just changing it around. We're transforming it. And that's what happens in the environment as well. So matter is assembled into living tissue or passed out of the body as waste products. So starting with the water cycle. All living things require water to survive. Water moves between the ocean, atmosphere, and the land. So the water cycle is pretty easy. So if we start on the ground and we start in the ocean, we can get water into the atmosphere in basically only two ways. One is evaporation, which you've heard of, and the other is called transpiration. We'll talk about this more in detail in a second. But these two processes make water vapor, and the water vapor can then condense, which is called condensation, and actually fall as precipitation back to the earth. The runoff then goes into lakes, into groundwater, and back into the ocean, and the cycle starts again. So water molecules enter the atmosphere as water vapor, which is a gas, when they evaporate from the ocean or other bodies of water. The process by which water changes from a liquid to a gas is called evaporation. Water can also enter the atmosphere by evaporating from the leaves of plants in a process called transpiration. So transpiration is just like evaporation, except it's evaporating from the leaves of plants. So water vapor then condenses into tiny droplets that form clouds, and the water returns to Earth's surface in the form of precipitation. Water enters streams or seeps into soil where it enters plants through their roots. And then the cycle starts again. Let's talk about the nutrient cycles. So all of the major atoms and elements that make you up actually cycle through the ecosystems. All the chemical substances that an organism needs to sustain life are called nutri nutrients. Every living organism needs nutrients to build tissues and carry out essential life functions. Similar to water, nutrients are passed between organisms and the environment through biogeochemical cycles. Primary producers, such as plants, usually obtain their nutrients in simple inorganic forms from their environment. Consumers obtain nutrients by eating other organisms. We'll start with the carbon cycle, since that is the, the main element of life. It's the key ingredient of living tissue. It makes up all of your macromolecules, your proteins, your lipids, uh, your carbohydrates, and your nucleic acids. So bio, biological processes such as photosynthesis, respiration, and decomposition, those are the main three, take up and release carbon and oxygen. Geochemical processes such as erosion and volcanic activity release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and the oceans. Biogeochemical processes such as the burial and decomposition of dead organisms and their conversion under pressure into coal and petroleum, also known as fossil fuels, store carbon underground. Human activities such as mining, cutting, burning forests, and burning fossil fuels release the carbon from the ground, underground, into the atmosphere. And it's a whole big cycle. So the first cycle 
is there's carbon dioxide in the ocean because there's organisms in the ocean that take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere, picked back up by the ocean, so on and so forth. Because there's also organisms in the ocean, like algae, that take up the carbon dioxide. And then there's organisms that breathe out carbon dioxide and return it to the atmosphere. So the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere then enters plants, either in the ocean or on land, in a process called photosynthesis. That carbon gets stored in these organisms, such as algae and plants, and when or other organisms feed on the plants, they take up the carbon. Also, these organisms then breathe out carbon dioxide. And you know this, we take in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. That is how CO2 gets back into the atmosphere. Then it gets a little more complicated. Okay, when plants and animals die, they decompose. Okay, decomposers break them into carbon once again. And those carbon compounds can de be deposited and eventually, over millions of years, turn into fossil fuels, also known as oil. Okay, so this is the same thing, decomposition, deposition. You can also get uh, deposition in the ocean or under the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean. It can turn into carbonate rocks, which can release carbon dioxide, but also these rocks can be uplifted um, to the surface and erosion can actually make them the carbon go back into the ocean. But also we can get volcanic activity where the carbon is returned to the atmosphere. Once again, we're returning to the atmosphere. Same with fossil fuels. Instead of volcanic activity and uplifting and erosion, we can burn fossil fuels by human activity to return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That was a very long cycle. The nitrogen cycle is pretty complicated as well. All organisms require nitrogen to make proteins. Okay, Nitrogen is one of the key components of proteins. So although nitrogen gas is the most abundant form of nitrogen on Earth, only certain types of bacteria can actually use this form directly. We can't just breathe in nitrogen, although it is one of the most common uh, forms of nitrogen in the atmosphere. So it needs to be converted. Bacteria that live in the soil and the roots of plants, called legumes, they convert this nitrogen gas into ammonia in a process called nitrogen fixation. They fix the nitrogen in the atmosphere into ammonia. Other bacteria in the soil convert the ammonia to nitrates and nitrites. Once these products are available, producers can use them to make proteins. So plants then take up the nitrates and nitrates and they produce or, and they make proteins. We then consume the plants to get our nitrogen. Consumers then eat the producers and reuse the nitrogen to make their own proteins. When organisms die, decomposers return nitrogen to the soil as ammonia. The ammonia may be taken up again by producers at this point. Other soil ba bacteria convert nitrates into nitrogen gas in a process that's called denitrification. So you can have the opposite happen. Instead of converting the nitrogen gas to ammonia, now we're taking nitrates and converting it into nitrogen gas. This process releases nitrogen into the atmosphere once again. So here's nitrogen in the atmosphere, okay? What happens is nitrogen in the atmosphere can be taken up by bacteria in a process called nitrogen fixation into ammonia, okay? Um, the second thing that can happen is nitrogen can actually be fixed by the atmosphere. That's why lightning is so important. Lightning can actually fix uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere into nitrites and nitrates. Okay. Also, there's nitrogen in fertilizer. Okay, And fertilizer can be taken up by producers just like the nitrites nitrates can be taken up by producers. Then, when consumers eat the producers or the plants, like this cow is eating the plants, we use that nitrogen for ourselves. Then when we die, we're broken down and it's converted back to ammonia. More nitrogen fixation can occur and we can have nitrates and nitrites taken up by producers in the ocean or on land. And once again, reused by consumers when we eat plants 
when they die, it's the organisms decompose, it's converted back into ammonia. Nitrites and nitrates can be converted by some bacteria in a process called denitrification and return the nitrogen back to the atmosphere. So the phosphorus cycle is also important. It's essential to organisms because it helps form important molecules like DNA and RNA. Most phosphorus exists in the form of inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate is released into the soil and water as sediments wear down. Phosphate eventually enters the ocean where it is used by marine organisms, and some phosphate stays on land in cycles between organisms and the soil. Plants bind the phosphates into organic compounds. So organic phosphate moves through a food web and the rest of the ecosystem. So it's in the sediments, and it's on land in the land sediments, and between the ocean and the land with erosion and weathering and all of that, it gets cycled between land and ocean and sediment. Okay, on the land, it is taken up by the roots of plants. Same with algae. It is then eaten by consumers like fish or cows. When we die, it is brought back to full circle. So there's also something called nutrient limitation in ecosystems. The primary productivity of an ecosystem is the rate at which organic matter is created by producers. One factor that controls the primary productivity of an ecosystem is the amount of available nutrients. This makes sense, okay? You can't have more organisms than there are nutrients. That just won't happen. So if a nutrient is in short supply, it will limit an organism's growth. Same with plants. If you're trying to grow a plant and you don't give it the right nutrients, it's just not going to grow. So when an ecosystem is limited by a single nutrient that is scarce or cycles very slowly, this substance is called a limiting nutrient. When an aquatic ecosystem receives a large input of a limiting nutrient, so something it normally doesn't have, it's normally limited, such as runoff from heavily, heavily fertilized fields, the result is often an immediate increase in the amount of algae and other producers. So there are limits to the nutrients naturally in the environment. If we as humans add to this limiting nutrient, okay, that's normally limited, and we're just adding abundant amounts, which you have, what happens is called an algal bloom. And you see this in streams all over California by where any agriculture takes place. Just look at a stream in California, and this is what you'll see. Because of the runoff from the fertilizer, a nutrient that is normally limiting is in huge supply, and you just get this huge algal bloom. And basically what it can do is it can disrupt the equilibrium of an ecosystem. It can throw off the balance. But we'll talk about that a lot later in later chapters. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching.